like the events that have been going on the past few weeks, um, I've just been feeling very, a lot of, a lot of emotions, um, mainly sad, mainly angry, and just, you know, um, wondering, you know, like, well, how does God feel about all of this? And so um, in reading it, I know that God is equally as upset as I am, and even more at that, because these are his children, we are his children. And so um, it's just relieving to me to know that as much as I want justice, as much as I want peace on earth, God wants it even more. And he knew that this was all, this all was going to happen from the beginning. And he had a plan. He had a plan to overcome it. He had a plan to be stronger than it. And he had a plan to champion over it. And so I just want to read, um, just like a little quote that was in my devotional, it's from Scott Sauls, and it says, for love to be truly loving, there must be judgment. If there is no judgment, then there is no hope for a slave, a rape victim, a child who has been abused or bullied, or people who have been slandered or robbed or had their dignity stolen. If nobody is called to account before a cosmic judgment seat for violence and oppression, then the victims will never see justice. We need a God who gets angry. We need a God who will protect his kids, who will once and for all remove bullies and perpetrators of evil from his playground. And um, when I read that, that just honestly gave me hope to know that um, God isn't complacent in this. God isn't all around us thinking, oh, wow, this is so terrible. No, he has, he has a plan. And um, no matter what the outcome of it all, I, I take hope in knowing that uh, this is not my home. Yeah, I'm supposed to be a steward of this home. It is not my it's not my true home and there's a place where justice reigns there's a place where um everyone is loved equally for who they are and um there's just a god that's stronger than this and there's a god that's a champion over this and so that's why i chose these two songs amen amen, amen. <laughs> There's love. There is a love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness none can deny. Through the storm and there is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ, you lift me. And you are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is in Jesus. El día del Señor. El día San. No beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. Came to seek and save the lost. Paid it all upon the cross. And you are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all, and you are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all, so let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. 
Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Amen. champion you are my champion giants fall when you stand not defeated every battle you won i am who you say i am giant from me with confidence i'm seated in the heavenly place i defeated the one who has conquered you. I tried so hard to see it. Took me so long to believe it. That you would choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. We don't deserve it. You take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. And giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I'm seated in the heavenly place, I'm defeated with the one who has conquered you. Now I can finally see it, you're teaching me how to receive it, so let all the striving see. This is my victory, you are my champion, and giants fall when you stand undefeated, every battle you won, I am who you say I am, you crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. With the one who has conquered it. When I lift my voice and shout.
Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. So much, Maritza. Let's have a word of prayer before we continue. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, God, that you have given us another opportunity to worship together. Lord, not just today, but you know, all, the, all the Sabbaths that we have gone together, Lord. And we want to thank you as well, Lord, for helping us all get through this week. A long week for some, Lord, maybe a tough week for many. But God, you have helped us and given us the victory to get through and make it to your Sabbath again. God, we want to thank you for everyone that's here with us and those that will be connecting as well. And God, we want to invite your presence to continue to be with us, Lord. Lord, prepare our hearts for your message. Prepare our hearts, dear Lord, to receive the truth that you have for us today. And we pray as well, dear God, that your Holy Spirit may do the work in us, Lord, preparing us. That, uh, that all these things that are going on, Lord, may just fill us with the hope of your soon coming. For we know that you are closer than yesterday and closer than you have been in the past. And for that, we praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Feliz sábado. Um, I'm going to be having the Sabbath school yes, lesson. Sabbath. Pastor, could you give me a screen sharing? Yes, sir. Let me get that OG. Happy Sabbath. Um, mm -hmm. I, do it. I like to do roll call just to pick on everybody. So, Meritza Filiber. What's up, Kev? Hello, hello, hello. We heard Alexis, Desenia, and Joey. Oh, hey. Hello, hello. Gwendy and Eden. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> Mari. Mari Mari. DJ Mari Mari. DJ Mari Mari. Mami Mari. Here, 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 here. Hello. And then we got. There you go. Jonathan. Yo. Joel. Uh, Victor Logan. Hey, hey, what's going on? Happy Sabbath. What's going on? Happy Sabbath. I think that's everybody. So let's go ahead and uh, let me know if you see my screen. Yes. So let me know if you guys see my screen. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to start off with a little yeah. prayer. Um, let me please bow our heads. Dear Lord God, Father God in heaven, we thank you today because, God, this has been another long week in quarantine. And, God, you know that the world has erupted even more over this past week. And God, we can only ask that we can get closer to you because now we're seeing the signs. We see the signs, God, that you're that the end is coming and that the world is coming to an end. And more importantly, that you're coming to take us now, God. God, now I ask that you please let us open our minds to learn something new in the Sabbath school lesson. May we understand something new. And may we continue to put this into work all throughout our lives. We ask for this in the most holy name we pray in. Amen. All right, so Amen. the Bible as history. How many of you guys have ever heard, give me a show of hands if you have your camera on or say something in the chat or even turn on your microphone for a second. How many of you guys have ever heard somebody say, the Bible isn't real, that's just some random book that somebody made up. None of that is real. Mm. Never walk the earth. How did Moses split up the Red Sea? This isn't anime. This isn't a YouTube movie. What are you talking about? How many of you guys have heard anything like that? Anything similar to that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. The anime thing's new, but absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then how many of you guys have heard that even some people want to discredit some parts of the Bible, like even Genesis? as just being unreal because science states where the science is completely assumption science states that the that the world was created by two atoms in the big bang how many of you guys have heard something like that yeah i've 
heard it in that exact same voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of discrediting of the Bible, and we have to be prepared because as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, point period, we're gonna, we're going to hear people, whether they be educated or just they saw a 12-minute YouTube video, they're going to try to discredit the Bible because that's that's the only real thing. If you if you want to learn something new, you have to try to discredit it until you understand it. And so, as you see here, by at the end of the 18th century, higher criticism, which means more educated people, began to study the Bible and disregarding any supernatural elements in, in it. So what are some supernatural things in the Bible? There's very many. Can I have Maritza, can you say one? Yes. Um, I guess some supernatural things could be God, uh, Jesus walking on water. Yup, that's right. Uh, Mary, can you... Mary. Mommy Mari. <laughs> can you give me something that's supernatural in the Bible? Supernatural in the Bible? Mm-hmm. Uh, they mentioned Jesus walking on water uh, when uh, the Red Sea was parted. The splitting of the Red Sea? Yeah. Okay, that's right. That's right. Can I have? Can I have Victor? Could you give me one last thing that's supernatural in the Bible? Uh, Lazarus coming back to life. That's right. Ding, ding, ding. Hundred points. Let's go. So a lot of people like to say, "Oh yeah, that's that that couldn't be possible," and they like to bring science and whatnot into it. However, once you start questioning any part of the Bible or disregarding any part of the Bible as well you start to question how true and the veracity, which means how true, like the trueness of it, of the people, as well as the places in it. And Christians, they remained silent. They didn't want to speak out. They didn't want to lash out. So archaeology, as well as assumptions, as well as the so-called 100% true carbon dating, wanted to speak throughout the 19th century. However, almost all the hypotheses, hypotheses of the higher criticism were discredited by all these new archeological findings, which we're gonna go into a lot more throughout the entire um, Sabbath school lesson. So one example is the Moabite stone, which is an account of the two Kings chapter three, where we can see, you see this picture down here? I can't even highlight it or anything. But this little yes. stone thing, this is an account of the events of two Kings chapter three. And it doesn't, of course, it's not going to state exactly to the, to the word by word what happened. However, it names the same names. It has the names of the same places. And if there's strict, if there's a, a rock that says the exact same things as the Bible with the exact same places and the exact same names, it has to be true. It seems like you really can't discredit this this rock that comes from thousands of years before. So we see something like I am Misha, king of Moab, and Omri as well, the king of Israel, another place that we know very much. And then I took it from the vessels of Jehovah while the house of David inhabited Haronai. So we're going to go through the first kings, the Assyrian invasion, Babylon, Jesus, and as well as a reliable story. So we're gonna start off with the first kings. So could I have John? Could you read uh, First Samuel seventeen one? It's right up here. Yeah, First Samuel seventeen one. It says, "Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Soco, which belongs to Judah, the encampment between Soco and Ezekah in Ephes Damim." Thank you. So here, what do we see? What do we see in this verse? What do we see a lot of? Places. Yes, that's right, locations. We see a lot of names being dropped. And the kings of David and Solomon, they were, they were considered mythical. They were, they were considered like legends that never happened. However, later, the location that was name dropped in this verse of Ephes Damon was revealed to be the current Kerbe Quaifa, which is this right here, and they use Google Maps, so you know it's not cap. <laughs> as well as Soko and Azika and Ela, which is Saul's camp, were 
all found. They don't, of course, they're not going to drop everything in here. Oh, we see Ella's Fortress as well right here. And in Saul's time, Kerbet Kefa was a fortified garrison. Does anybody know what a garrison is? Anybody know anything about war times or anything about forts? Well, essentially, a garrison is a fort of some kind. And this means that the fight between David as well as Goliath took place in a real place between real armies. And we see this right here was a location. This little, this little ridge as well as this little ridge, this, this in between between the ridges. So we, we continue to see that this account of 1 Samuel 17, 1, the fight between David and Goliath and whatnot, and all that happened. This is true because we can see in this rock here, we can see Hazael's inscription. We can see the name of one of Saul's sons, Eshbal, was found on a pot, which continues to prove that this actually happened. There were people that were actually named that are in the Bible. We can see physical inscriptions in art from back then. And the house of David was also mentioned in an, in an inscription of Hazael, the king of Damascus. So now we're gonna we're gonna pass on and we're gonna move over to the Assyrian invasion. And what I and just to elaborate, what we want to learn today in this lesson is the ability to prove to people that the set that the Bible is truly true. We're gonna use both archaeology as well as little treasures and whatnot to try and to no, not even to try, but to prove to people that you can say, hey, yeah, you might think that David and Goliath never happened, but how are you gonna say that when we can see the fortress, we can see, we can see Saul's son's names in, in pots and whatnot. So I want you guys to be able to be well equipped to come back with anything that you need. So now we're gonna look into the Assyrian invasions. So who were the Syrians back in the day? Were they nice people? No. Nope. They were complete barbarians. And it's it's true. So now we're gonna look into Isaiah 36 1. And could I have um, uh, uh now it came to the past in 14 years, a king as a king it's a king a king as king am against all the fortune uh, few with citizen Judah I talk to them. Thank you very much, Alexis. You're welcome, so, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So in 701 BC, Sennacherib invaded Judah. And he destroyed Lashish and besieged Jerusalem. And this was proved when in, in his palace in Nineveh was unearthed. So we're gonna see that the account of the destruction of Lashish was found and that and that's shown in Sennacherib's annals which we which we can't really read because we don't we don't speak hebrew or whatever the language they used to speak back then but once again an account of the destruction of lashes was found besides the ruins of lashes are also proof of this event that Sennacherib destroyed lashes so Sennacherib's annals annals and annals tell how he couldn't conquer Jer jerusalem <clears throat> But as for Je Hezekiah the Judean, I shut him in his city like a bird in a cage. However, of course, I'm not going to mention what happened. What happened to them when they try to when they try to conquer uh, Jerusalem? Does anybody know what happened when they tried to conquer Jerusalem? Angel, angel, wasn't like like when God sent angels to fight for the king or something. So like the angels pretty much fought the war, and they left. Or kill them actually, kill the, the people. Yep, they got bodied. And in very little words, they got bodied by the angel of the Lord. <laughs> and they also confirmed this account of the Bible. They also confirmed the Bible's account of his death. And um, you can also see here <clears throat> the engraving showing the destruction of Lashish, which was which we talked about before. And then the biggest, um, the biggest revelation and not even rebellion, Sennacherib was then killed by his two sons, which we can also see in the, in the annals in Isaiah 37, 38. So now we're gonna head over to Babylon. 
and this has a lot of more a, a lot more of um, inscriptions and art and that's because babylon was the was a crazy city so we're gonna have daniel 4 30 can i have pastor can you read daniel 4 30 yes the king spoke is saying it's not a great Babylon that's had built for the royal governing mass mighty powers and for the honors and majesty thank you alexis yeah <laughs> amen amen so once again the king spoke saying is this not great babylon that i have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty and the greek historian herodotus thought that Samarat was a queen of babylon and that she rebuilt it and made it great however he didn't know about nebuchadnezzar or belshazzar and today now we know that Samurat was a queen of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar had rebuilt Babylon, and Belshazzar was co-reigned with his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And we can see that through the Ishtar gates. The Ishtar gate was one of the gates to the inner city of Babylon, and is currently displayed in the Pergamon Museum in Germany. And we can also see more of the Babylon, um, the Babylon logos, say, for lack of words, as in, Dan in um, lions, to show that Babylon, that shows lions as a symbol of the city. You can see a winged lion on the left, lion on the right. You can see lions and more other animals on the Ishtar gate, <clears throat> basically proving that Babylon was a great city, like a huge city, which was crazy. If I may, they were also showing the wing lion. It's a way that Daniel represented Babylon. And then we see when they did the excavations and everything, the archaeologists, they found the lion. So this is the way that Babylon was identified himself. That's true. Uh, the wing lion was one of the ways that, that Babylon was identified, as Mami Mari said. And when we see the wing line in actual art today, or not even in art from back in the day, now that we see it physical face to our face, we can be proven, or it is proven that what David or Daniel um, said in the Bible, it's once again proven. So now we're gonna head over to Jesus, Jesus. And there's very little accounts of strictly Jesus, like the name Jesus, Jehovah, that. However, there's accounts of everybody around him as well. There's accounts of Pontius Pilate, the people that killed him, everything around that. So Matthew 27, 2, Alexis, take it away. Yes, I hear. Uh, so what's your read? Oh, that one. and when the day of the hand upon him, they live on the way, deliver him to Pontius Pilate. Pirai, the governor. Thank you. So uh, once amen. again, higher, higher criticism also questioned the existence of Jesus. So has anybody ever here heard that Jesus was never real? He couldn't be possible. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they alleged a lack of historical records of him or his contemporaries however later a monument from the first century showed that the inscription was found and what did they find they found pontius Pil pilate and who's who is pontius pilate what did he do? Why is he? Why is? Why does anybody care about him? Is he even like related to Jesus by at any chance? He's the one who basically. No. Off. What'd you say, Maritza? You're asking who um, Pontius Pilate is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he's the one who basically co-signed on Jesus' crucifixion. Correct, and we see that both in the yeah. Bible, and if if he is the governor at that point, and it is written then you can't really deny the fact that he did what he did. And the Bible walks within that line of reality that Pontius Pilate 
was the government. And you have to be something of that, of that like height of reign to be able to co-sign on what goes on with Jesus. So in the funerary box, which I'm assuming that's like a coffin, <clears throat> of Caiaphas and his family has also been found. So we see Caiaphas, which was also one of the contemporaries around Jesus. We see his actual like coffin type of thing. And these findings also collaborate with the story found in the gospels and as well as the account of the historian, the human historian, like the normal per like the mere mortal historian of a Flavius Josephus. And these and there's more letters which we haven't which they're not shown here, but they also conform they confirm the history, the history of Jesus and Christianism in the first century. For example, Tacitus and Pliny the Younger, those are some letters that are, um, they're from like other things. They're from like other, uh, like, I think they're Greek. Yeah, I think Tac Tacitus and Pliny, I think they're Greek or something. But once again, we see that the Bible is proven to be historically reliable, not only through the Bible, However, through physical things and art that we can see in coffins. So now we're going to go into a reliable story, which kind of wraps up the rest of this Sabbath school lesson. So Hebrews 11.32. Alexis, can you take it away? Yes. Hey, I want you more sure I say, I say, for the time would have failed me to the tell. Gino uh Barak and Samson 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 and George Jerry that also the David Samuel that the prophet. Thank you. And so here so what do we see here in this verse? What do you see a lot of once again? No. Oh. What do we see a lot of in this verse? Uh account of historical events in the Bible. In the Bible, history uh, stories in the Bible, things that and the made amazing things that happen. Yep, we see a lot of names being dropped: Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And what type of book is Hebrews considered to be as? What type of book was Hebrews always like thought of as? What do you mean, Kevin? What type like, of book? Like, like is it? Like, it's not historical? Like, I don't know. Hebrews is yeah. not historic. Yeah. I honestly just had a brain fart. I'm, I'm so confused right now. There isn't a gloss <laughs> over that. I just had a brain fart. <laughs> I had something good, so prepared for that. And then the second I said it, just, Oop. so we're just going to continue on. So most of the Bible contains the account of historical events, true and reliable events, as we've seen in the previous section, where we can see that it's still proven to this day in art and physical things and coffins and pieces of uh, literature as well. And there is archeological evidence that support the reliability of the Bible. However, they cannot be the base of our faith because is the Bible what is the Bible or what is Christianity based on? Is it based on the Bible or is it based on Jesus? Jesus. Yes. Our, our, God. our faith mm -hmm. is based on, yeah, the, the Holy Trinity, Jesus, mm -hmm. the Bible, or Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God. And the Bible is more than just history. It contains, it contains also the stories of men and women of faith who believed in God as well as followed his, his instructions. <clears throat> And their acts of faith, of faith, trust, and faith and trust motivates us more to follow their examples. And the Bible can transform our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. So when we read the Bible, it's not supposed to be reading the Bible just to, just to finish off the daily Bible, the daily audio Bible. It's not supposed to just be glossing through it, just looking at every word. It's supposed to be reading and understanding and listening to the context, as well as praying about it before and after to have the help of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand it. So now here are some more uh, evidence that the Bible actually happened, the stories of the Bible actually happened. So in 1935, a seal belonging to Gedaliah, the son of Pasha, was found, which that's in Jeremiah 38.1. 
1984, another seal belonging to Milkomer, the servant of the Ammonite king Baalis, Jeremiah 40, 14. 1996, an amphora was found. Hello, I think I cut off for a second. In 1996, an amphora was found showing the inscription. I'm getting a call, so I just had to call into that. Rachel Rodi. Yeah, and that's and that was posed to Herod, king of Judea. In 2009, a seal belonging to King Hezekiah was found in Jerusalem, although the inscription wasn't understood until 2015. And in that same year, an engraving was made with the seal that said Isaiah the prophet was just found 10 feet from where Hezekiah's seal had been found. So we can see through these through these five just like anecdotes, the Bible has been proven not just in itself, however, also in physical archaeology out in the world. That we can see these things and we can we can say to the people that say, Oh, the Bible wasn't real, how can you disprove the fact that there's literally a seal that is talking about Isaiah the prophet, King Hezekiah, Herod, the Ammonite King Baalis? And once again, we shouldn't, we shouldn't conform all of our faith all into just trying to prove that the Bible is real because that's what faith is. Faith is having 1,000, 10 billion, 100,000 percent faith that the Bible is true and focus more on how we can help other people to believe that it is true. This should be a, used as a tool to disprove the other people saying, oh, the Bible is never real. Jesus never existed. This is why we study something like this, to once again understand that the Bible goes in a, the Bible happened, ha, is happening and will continue to happen because now we're living in the end times. We, we've heard that the murder horns were coming. And what does it say in the, in the Bible? That in the ends of times, there will be flocks of, of insects infesting everywhere. There will be, there will be diseases, there will be this, there will be that, there will be riots, there will be fires, there will be everything. And what are we living right now? What can we see around us that, that shows us that we're in the end of times? The times Everything. of wars and rumors of war, and, uh, people dying of this COVID-19 and something else that is coming, something else that like we hear the Ebola is going back in Africa, it's coming back again, and uh, many other things that we don't know at the moment that they're uh -huh. happening. Thank you. And with that, all we can do is continue to keep our faith, our eyes pointed toward God. Keep God number one, and he'll focus on everything else. Even when we have a good week or a bad week, we have to continue to have God at number one, at the number one position. Because the second we take him off, that's when we lose everything. Mm -hmm. And maybe the devil will try and think, oh, yeah, you know, just do this for a little second. Don't worry about it. That the second you take your foot off the gas, that's when your life comes to pass. And with that, I want to I wanna go ahead and have our Kevin. heads bowed, bow our heads. Kevin. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, to add, if I may, uh, that uh, the, the, the lesson this week is history in the Bible. And then many things, many historians, they corroborate it. And we'll, we get all, the Bible as, as history. And we get all happy when, you know, people can prove what is in the Bible. And then we get lost ourselves in proving, you know, seeing and having controversies and this uh discussions about you know it's true it's not evolution versus uh, uh creation and all this stuff and for the main point in here is to know that god has been working and was is and will be active throughout the history of this world and whatever and through the history of our lives many times we pay more attention like you said like to complete something like, you know, as if it were a subject in, subject in school, we're studying for a test. Once we got the grade, the passing grade, whatever, then we forget because we're like, oh, I'm not going to be using that because I'm going to go for something else. 
uh, I'm gonna major in something else or something else in school, so I don't care about these. I just wanna pa pass that grade. It's not about that. It's about finding God and finding how God works through every story in the Bible. The God is real. Yes, it's been proven, but my faith shouldn't be cemented just because an archaeologist found something that is found in the Bible, but because I've seen how God has worked, have, have worked throughout the Bible and how God has worked through me and it's been working on me. Amen. And with that, Mommy Mari, could I have you could I ask you to pray? Sure. Let's bow our head. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to study, for giving us the opportunity to go over this lesson. Um, we ask your Lord that each and every one of the people in here listening to this lesson, although they've been quiet, and I pray that they will be in paying attention. And if they didn't understand anything, that they can ask questions to the right people, and then they can go to the Bible because the Bible explains itself. And uh, we can go to you in the middle of everything, whatever is happening around us. If we go through the Bible, we're going to find out that no matter what happened, there were many things happening, plagues, people invading others, killings and everything. But what we read in the Bible is that God is always taking care of his people and he always takes care of us. May that be in our minds in the present times that we are living right now in history. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. And that is the Sabbath school lesson for this week. God Thank bless you, America. Friends. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for everybody that was able to participate. Alrighty. So I'm going to share some announcements here. Uh, in just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to start off with, um, you know, the, the normal reminders that um, of our Bible study. That's every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Um, you can find this flyer on our Instagram page and also on our Facebook page. Um, invite others to join in um, every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Also on Thursdays, we have... Um, like a prayer meeting, just to pray with each other. It's every Thursday at 8 p.m. Um, this one, I know it's a little hard to um, to make it sometimes. We all have our own schedules and stuff like that. But if you can, uh, try. Um, I was thinking, just an idea, that uh, since we don't have testimony and prayer while we're doing these Zoom conferences, maybe we can utilize the chat feature and if anybody has any prayer requests, anything, you know, that they have on their heart right now, um, they can put it inside the chat. And, you know, this starting this week, we can pray for those prayer requests or even present them on Thursdays um, when we pray with Redemption Chapel. So join yeah. us on Thursdays. And then here I have an invite from Vine Haven. Um, hopefully you can hear it. Let me know if you cannot. Oh, I can't even hear it. Oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry. Hello, my name is Kayla Lutzum, and I'm a part of the Vine Haven Adventure School's eighth grade graduating class of 2020. I would like to invite you to a graduation on Thursday, June 11th. The kindergarten graduation will be held at 6 p.m. and the eighth grade graduation will be held at 7 p.m. It will be broadcasted on YouTube and Facebook. If you would like to join our watch party on Zoom, the information will be on the flyer. Hope to see you there. So I will actually post that flyer on our Instagram as well and our Facebook. Was everybody able to hear that? Yes. 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 Kind of, okay, because I have another video to play and I didn't want to, um, wasn't sure if you heard it. I have another one from Vine Haven as well. Um, just a little information, what's going on. This is like their end of the year video. And it's really good to see how our school that is near and dear to our hearts has adjusted to 
you know, this new way of life with um, COVID-19. So I hope you guys enjoy this video as well. Fine Haven Adventist School is an institution that strives for excellence in both its students and staff. Due to the current circumstances, the school has closed its doors, but that has not stopped our staff from attending to the academic and spiritual needs of our students. Hello guys, my name is Shadia Arroyo and I'm in 6th grade at Vine Haven Adventist School. And today I'm going to show you guys how I have a good day of online learning. As soon as I finished eating, I go back upstairs and get ready to log on to worship with the rest of my class. For each of my classes, I have to go on to Zoom. To get into my class, I must put in my ID and password to join the classroom. Good morning, guys, and welcome back to our class. We're going to start today with a devotional. My favorite part of doing online learning would have to be how much time it saves. It saves so much time. It takes all of four minutes for me to um, get up and join the classes that I need to be in. My favorite part of online learning is that we can stay at home and be comfortable. We don't have to wear a school uniform. And for all they know, we could be wearing our pajamas. I am happy that I can further my education and continue doing my classwork. Though we may not be in school with each other, we can still be achieving these goals online. It's a lot more comfortable than going to school. Having an Adventist education is important to me because I think it's important to be allowed to pray and be um, open about your religion. It means to me that I can have a great education that also incorporates Jesus Christ and the learning of Him and His Word. Adventist education impacts my life because it helps my spiritual life grow. I can learn about God and peace knowing that there are others around me who are learning the same thing and have the same religion. Thanks to the support of our Vine Haven family, our academic staff, our parents, and the New Jersey Conference, our children are receiving the best education possible. Okay, amen. That was a lovely video. Um, oh, sorry, one second. Okay, may we continue to keep our school in our prayers and continue to support, support them as much as we can, um, especially with the upcoming school year as well. Uh, moving on to the family that we will be praying for this week is the Echeverria family. Unfortunately, they did lose the matriarch of their family. Her name was Hilda Echeverria. And um, uh, we should just keep them in prayer. Um, this family makes up a very large portion of our violent Spanish church, our violent Spanish church family. And um, so let's just keep them in prayer as well during this difficult time. Um, and also just a reminder, every Saturday at 1130, we have our worship here. Invite your friends, invite your family. And that is all. I hope everyone has a great Sabbath. And don't forget to put your prayer requests inside the chat feature that Zoom has, um, and I hope you guys have a great day. Happy Sabbath. Do you believe that it's possible to bribe God by giving tithes and offerings, convincing him to grant special protection, and to answer your prayers while you're disregarding other commandments? No. And here's why. Although the Bible says that unfaithfulness to God in tithes and offerings may lead to curse, it is also clear that God cannot bless those who give them while disregarding other important aspects of His will. David says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord God will not hear. Solomon also says that the one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Well, considering that we all break the law and that we're all sinners, how then can our prayers and offerings be acceptable to God? The answer is found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, the process of cleansing from sin requires the acceptance of Christ's death on my behalf and the work of the Holy Spirit, changing the heart, 
it must take place before any act of worship. The book of Malachi says that only after the experience that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord. In other words, God accepts tithes and offerings only from those who accept Jesus' death on their behalf. God's offering for the sinners who confess their sins and keep asking for the Holy Spirit to change their inclinations, giving them the desire to do what is good and right. As you return your tithe and give your promise, ask God to help you to accept Jesus' death, His offering, and your place. Ask Him to remind you all of the areas in your life where you've been falling short. Confess them to Jesus so that all your sins can be forgiven, your heart transformed, and your offerings may please Him and be accepted by Him. May we put our desires last and God first. Amen. Amen. Now we have a special message here from the president of our conference, Pastor uh, Jorge Aguero. During this time, our nation, our cities, our community has been suffering from disease, pain, death, and now injustice and violence. So I want to invite you to join the initiative of the Columbia Union that this Saturday, June 6, we can make time to pray for our nation, for physical and spiritual healing, for justice, reconciliation, and peace. God says in his word, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Thank you for joining with us in prayer this Sabbath, June 6. Amen. So uh, with that, with that being said, we're going to take a moment right now to just uh, lift up a prayer to God. Um, I'm going to ask if, uh, uh, Jonathan, would you be able to, uh, to have one of the prayers as well? Sure. Jonathan and uh, jo Joey, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Joey, can you, um, Joey, can you have prayer for, um, our, our country, our nation, uh, everything going on so that God can bring, uh, restoration. He could bring healing to the many families, uh, that are, that are suffering right now. And, uh, Johnny, I was going to ask you if you could pray for our churches as well to see, you know, for God to give our churches wisdom on how we can minister and serve, and then uh, I'll finish with uh, another prayer. So those of, those of you that are able, uh, if you can, you know, we're gonna go on our knees to pray. Uh, and then Joey, you can begin with prayer, with the prayer. All right. The Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to be together. Despite the fact that we aren't physically together, we are able and capable of having these zoom meetings regardless where we're at there might have been other days and other times during the sabbath that some of us wouldn't be able to make it to the actual temple but now we have less of a reason not to actually be in as a church during these times specifically we ask for you to be with us so that we can come together more and more every day not only with each other but with you so that with you in our hearts, with you in, in our mind, we can become stronger as a people. Realize that everything that's going on, Lord, has nothing up against you. As there's nothing that you can't handle. There's nothing that we won't be able to do as long as we put our part and we keep you centered in our lives. And 
keep your word true to our lives. All this, the uh, the pandemic that's happening, all these riots, all the the injustice that's happening in this world, not only with these topics that are prone and headlines today, but everything that's happening within our own separate lives that aren't headline news, that aren't public eyes and things that are just within our hearts. We pray that you help us with all of that. We pray that you help us build ourselves up, our families, and keep on building up until we're able to reach the level that you want us to be and be a Christ-centered nation, Christ-centered family and persons. We pray everything in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Dear Holy Father, Lord, thank you once again for the Sabbath day. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to connect with one another through uh, this form, Lord. I, I pray for our churches, Father God, who uh, during these times have found themselves closed uh, physically, Lord, but spiritually, the church keeps going on, Lord. And we thank you for allowing us to being able to come in communication with you, Father God, because we are not uh, tied down to just a physical building, but Father God, we can praise you wherever we are in, in, in our homes, Lord, wherever we may find ourselves. And we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I, I want to pray specifically for um, the church families, Father God, all of our brothers and sisters from all over the country. Uh, Lord, we're living in a time now where the church more than ever needs to be present in the community, Father God. And I ask and I pray that you uh, allow us and help us and guide us in order to do that, Father God, as there are people who uh, are, are seeking justice uh, through their own terms, Father God. And, and I completely understand them, Father God. Uh, but Lord, the justice, the true justice comes from you, and uh, we want to help our community understand that uh, you care for each and every one of us, Father God. We are all your children, and therefore you have set out to protect us and to be our, our defender in all of these things, Father God. Please, Lord, allow the church to just uh, uh, be strong during these times, Lord, uh, and to be present in this time as well. Uh, where we can be able to show the world who we are and, and who you are, Lord. Uh, Father God, I pray that uh, each church family that is present here today, each church family that is uh, wherever they are, Lord, may you be able to guide them and help them, Father God, keep them strong. Um, and Lord, I pray for the families who are going through tough times right now, whether it be uh, the disease uh, they have found themselves uh, affected by by COVID, Father God, and maybe they don't have any more resources, Father God. I ask you to be with them, Father God, and allow us to be a light unto them as well, Father God. Please, Lord, I pray and I ask in the holy name. Amen. Amen. Loving and merciful Father, we continue to come before you, dear God, recognizing the power that you have, the authority that you have and are over this universe, dear Lord. And how it doesn't matter if you're in heaven, it doesn't matter if you're on earth, dear Lord, nothing escapes your eye and nothing, Lord, escapes your ears. You are fully aware of everything going on, dear God, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that we might not be able to see you, but we know that you are present with us even now as we pray, as we bow before you. And Father, I lift up to you, dear Lord, the, uh, the, the struggle and, and the suffering of this family, the Echevarria family, Lord. They have lost uh, a mother, they've lost uh, a wife, they've lost father, uh, a member, not just to their family, but to the church, to the community. And Lord, we pray that you bring healing to them. We pray that you bring comfort. We pray that you bring peace. And Lord, most importantly, may they never forget that hope that they have, Lord, of being reunited with their loved one again. God, um, we ask, Lord, that you help them through these days, through these moments. And Father, may their, and may their hope be in, in the fact that as Jesus was lifted up, Lord, was raised, dear God, um, the promise is, Lord, that if you did it for him, you would do it for every one of your children as well. Father in heaven, we also pray for, um, for, for Reina, Lord, uh, Elena and Ricky's daughter, Lord, you know their situation. We pray that you be with her. We pray, Father, that that God, you will, uh, you will restore, you will heal. We pray, Father, that you will give, Lord, uh, uh, 
uh, back to her as well, Lord. We pray, Father, we, we that everything may continue to go well. And Lord, um, dear God, there's there's no better place that we can place um, any of our loved ones, Lord, uh, to put them into your hands, dear God, and know that, God, they, it is your hands that work through other people to bring healing, to bring health, to bring restoration and recovery. Father in heaven, we want to pray for Shiomara as well, Lord, that uh, she wasn't feeling so well yesterday. May you bring health and restoration to her. Dear God, we pray, Father, that even, uh, I don't think she's connected with us, but Lord, may you help her recover. May you bring, Father, uh, peace to her heart, to her mind. Lord, let this not be something for her to worry about. But Father, we we ask and, and we lift her up to you as well, Lord. And if any other of our family members or friends might be hurting during this time, physically, emotionally, Lord, spiritually, spiritually, dear God, we pray that, that Lord, as Jesus came and healed physically so that he might also heal them of their sins and remove and forgive, Father, that you might do the same in their hearts today, wherever they are, Lord. We don't know, we may not know all of them, but you know who they are, Lord, and we ask and, and, and plead in their behalf that your presence might be in their lives today. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask especially for our, for the, our speaker today that, Lord, you anoint him with your words. Anoint him, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Father, put your words in his mouth and may he, uh, may he speak life into us, Lord, according to your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce everybody. Uh, to our speaker, Sean Warrix. There's Sean. Thank you, Sean, for connecting with us. Sean is currently in West Virginia. And uh, we actually met him last, last Sabbath during the, the, the panel discussion that we were having um, about what does the Bible say about the end times. And so I asked Sean if he would uh, be willing to share a word with us today. And thank you for, again, for accepting. Um, Sean was a, uh, or is, he was a medical student, a U.S. medical student. Uh, he said that he withdrew from medicine to pursue a full-time career in ministry. He says he believes that our salvation is an intellectual salvation, one where we reason together with the Lord, not a salvation based on emotion or how we feel. Satan wrung the heart of Jesus, but Jesus was never lost, nor did he ever sin. Amen for that because then there would be no hope for us at all. Uh, Sean has a passion for young adult evangelism, where he works to establish the called, equip the chosen, and enable the faithful to finish the work. Sean, this is an amazing question, I think, um, according, especially him being a, having been a, a, a med student. Um, where would we be if we studied our Bibles like a med student studies to pass his or her boards? Where would the church be? Where would our lives be spiritually? His favorite Bible verse is Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then shall they, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Sean, welcome again, and uh, may the Lord use you and guide you uh, as you deliver his word to us. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is, is there a way I could share my screen uh, from my side of the, the thing here? I'll yeah, share. Yeah, you have, you have access. I see now. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll share that in a minute. So, because I have like a note study for everybody to see. Um, I'm at a disadvantage because all of you know what I look like, but I don't get to see all of your faces. Um, but that's okay. Um, I trust uh, that all of you are <clears throat> here uh, on, on a good reason and that you have the right motive to keep the Sabbath today. And uh, Pastor Carlos uh, has reached out to me and he, we had some conversation this week uh, in good conversation and, and we kind of picked this topic. Um, and so I want to share with you all today a Bible study from the book of Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 
18 and 19, and we're going to look at this relationship between Paul and Apollos as we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know, um, so a little bit about me, uh, aside from just, just being in school, uh, in undergrad, I spent a lot of my time uh, having Bible studies with kids of different religious backgrounds. Uh, I went to West Virginia University, and so West Virginia University is home to 154 different ethnic uh, worldviews and religions and, and people from different 154 different countries. And so there's a lot of diversity there uh, at West Virginia University. So I spent my time, I've had Bible studies with what was called the Mountaineer Catholics Organization, which was the, the Catholic student organization. Uh, with Young Life, with Crew, some of you may know these names, Young Life is with the Methodist Church, uh, with Baptist Campus Ministries, which is supported by the Baptist Conference. Um, and I even uh, had some, ad tried to have like an Adventist Bible study group on campus, but um, uh, doing all of these things, I, I kind of have this burden, this ministry, number one, for young people, number two, for Protestants. Alan White says in The Great Controversy at the End of Time, uh, the Adventist church will be the last Protestants remaining. And she says, God has given us the, the goal in chapter 11 of a great controversy to restore the spirit of true Protestantism. Uh, I heard a, a one Adventist friend of mine says, we are not Protestant, but Protestant. Uh, same spelling, different pronunciation. And, and so today we're going to look at a very practical, <clears throat> excuse me, a very practical Bible study on, on this lesson of being a witness, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and walking in the direction God has called us to walk. And I hope it's a blessing to you all. Uh, there might be a couple places where I ask a question, so feel free to chime in. I'm used to kind of the classroom discussion conversation from my background, so don't, you won't offend me at all if you chime in or say anything. Um, we want to garner an open place of discussion where everybody can feel comfortable asking questions or sharing any of their thoughts. We're here now, and so hopefully, so we're, hopefully everybody can see this. And our, our Bible study this morning takes place in Acts chapter 18. And we're going to compare essentially the last part of Acts 18 and the first part of Acts 19. And what happens here, let's see if I can uh, make a laser there. I don't know how to make the laser there. Um, so in Acts chapter 18, uh, let's have a word of prayer here so we can uh, focus our hearts and our minds together on the word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray and ask for your Holy Spirit, your, which is your spirit of truth, which is the comforter. Lord, I pray and ask that you will guide our hearts and our minds, and that you will lead us in this Bible study, and that you will give us the truth that we need to know from it, I pray. Put forth your hand and touch my lips and give me words to say, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter 18, we read about Apollos, and Apollos was a missionary evangelist. And we read here in verse 24, there was a Jew named Apollos, native to Alexandria, and he came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man. So notice what's written about Apollos, because what we're going we're gonna to ask a very specific question once we're done here. Apollos was an eloquent man, knowledgeable in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately to welcome him. And, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So here we have Apollos. He's this brilliant speaker. He's, he's well-versed. He's eloquent, knowledgeable in the scriptures, taught in the school of Christ, uh, would refute the Jews in the synagogue. And so Apollos had all of these characteristics of what we would probably consider a good public speaker, a good orator, somebody we would pay to listen to. And he drew in these large crowds, and here he was in Ephesus drawing in this crowd and how well he spoke. So the first question we have to ask ourselves here, given all of these attributes of Apollos, did he have the Holy Spirit? I've, 
I've asked all sorts of people this question uh, in groups, uh, both in the Adventist churches and in, in Bible study groups with people who are of different religious backgrounds. And, and most people intrinsically say, yes, Apollos was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was eloquent. And I asked them why. They said, well, he was eloquent. He knew the scriptures. He was instructed in the way. He was fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately. He spoke boldly in the synagogue and he refuted the Jews. So how could a man not have the Holy Spirit and do all of these things? Well, I want to uh, maybe suggest that he didn't have the Holy Spirit here. And because there are some very kind of fine things going on between the lines here. And, and we have to ask ourselves as you're going through this personally, do you have the Holy Spirit? And if so, how do you know? Because here we see Apollos who did all these things, but he was actually lacking in one thing. And here it says Priscilla and Aquila, which were uh, essentially leaders in the church of Ephesus, when they heard him speaking, they heard all that he said and something caught their attention. And so they took Apollos to the side and said, here, we need to teach you something. And they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Well, what could they have taught Apollos more accurately concerning God, given all of these, there's actually, if you count, there's seven attributes uh, that describes Apollos as public speaking. So he had these seven things, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But here it says he needed to be taught the th way of God more accurately. And so that's very interesting. Before we go on, um, we this is the end of Acts chapter 18 and verse 28. So we begin reading the next passage in Acts 19. Paul shows up to Ephesus after Apollos leaves. And so it, it's like kind of like Paul's the preceptor, he's your boss or whatever, and Apollos was one of his missionaries. And after Apollos has this big evangelistic crusade, and there's a bunch of baptisms at the end, um, Paul comes in, maybe he's like the journal, the conference president, and he comes in and takes a survey. He goes, how did, what do you all think of Apollos? How did he do? Did he preach you well? Did he teach doctrine correctly? And did you feel revived? And notice what Paul observes here while um, he's in Ephesus. So what happened, Apollos was sent to Corinth. Paul passes through the inland country and came to Ephesus. So Paul's back now in Ephesus and Ap Apollos just left. There, Paul found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And when they had said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. Hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. It kicked me off. Um, Continue. Sorry about that. No problem. Let me. Is everybody good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so here we have, in summary, what happened was Apollos comes in, he does an excellent job, yet he lacks one thing. He forgets to baptize them in the Holy Spirit, the baptism of Christ. However, Paul comes along and he, a man having the Holy Spirit, is able to lay hands on them and baptize them into the Holy Spirit, giving them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to ask ourselves today, living in the last days, do we have the Holy Spirit? Because our part of our gospel commission is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we have to do this to be able to complete the gospel commission. So how do we know if we have the Holy Spirit then? John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8 answers this question, or it gives us what is the office of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, Jesus is speaking here, for if I, do not, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
So the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And I know we've all heard this. And so the question is, how do we make sense of this to where it practically makes sense we can apply it in our lives? Because Apollos, who was trained in the theological schools, probably knew this was the job of the Holy Spirit. But he only understood it in theory, and he didn't actually possess it in practicality. And as a remnant church, we want to practice what this actually means. So what does it mean to convict the world of sin? And in, in, to be convicted of sin, then this is my personal interpretation, uh, and I tried to find this based in Scripture. To be convicted of sin is to be convicted of what we are doing wrong, what we are doing that's wrong. So when you're convicted of your sin, you, it's when the Holy Spirit falls on you and you, you realize you shouldn't be doing something. You shouldn't be drinking. You shouldn't be cussing. You shouldn't be listening to that kind of music. You shouldn't be overeating. Whatever it is, you shouldn't be doing it. That's when you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit of sin. And what the response is, we all need to be convicted of what we are doing wrong that we may come to repentance. Conviction leads to repentance. It, the next thing is to be convicted of righteousness. To be convicted of righteousness is to be convicted of the good things we should be doing. A lot of times, um, we may have people who have a full knowledge of sin and know not to do certain sins, and they, they live out personal lives of piety, but they lack doing the things God calls them to do. They, they don't go door to door. They, they don't you know, they're not good with friendship evangelism. When they, somebody gets baptized into the church, the, the, the church falls short of discipling that new member. You always want to disciple the new members that come into your church. You want to make sure that somebody gets assigned to the new member so that they're checking up on them, that you're sending them Bible verses, that you're spending, you know, you're meeting up once a week. I had a lady who, uh, who told me that her daughter got baptized into the Adventist church. And before she got baptized, the pastor kept telling her, oh, you got to get, you. oh, hey, you're going to get baptized. Hey, let's have Bible study. You know, you need to get baptized. God called you to get baptized. When are you going to get in the tank? You need to take and, and be baptized. He called her all the time and people were messaging her. Her daughter said once she got baptized, she says the entire church quit calling her. The pastor quit talking to her. The, her, the, the women stopped inviting her over for dinner. And she felt like she was led into something, but then she was uh, led out to a ledge and nobody was there. And she felt horrible that why would I stay in a church where nobody actually cares about me? And so one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of righteousness, the things that we should be doing, but aren't, which is different from being convicted of sin, which is the things we're doing wrong that we should stop. And lastly, it says the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict them of judgment. In other words, there is a sense of urgency. If you don't respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brings it to you, you're in trouble because you can grieve the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. You can uh, grieve away the Holy Spirit, which is the final hardening of the heart. And this will happen to the whole world as it says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 and verse 5, it says God saw their hearts and it says their thoughts were only evil continually. And it says his restraining spirit was withdrawn from the earth. And so we see that this time of judgment is happening now and time is of urgency. It's great urgency. And so these are the things that the Holy Spirit convict us of. So this is the part one in asking yourselves, do you have the Holy Spirit? And if this pattern is true, we should probably be able to find it in Scripture wherever else we look. And one of the places uh, in Scripture that's very uh, unique to this pattern is John chapter 4. And John chapter 4, verses 6 to 39, is the story of the woman at the well. Here she has an encounter with the living Christ. And the question is, when she's done interacting with Jesus, does she leave being baptized with the Holy Spirit? And this is what we're going to see. 
And if so, do we see her being convicted of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness in her life as a response to meeting Christ at the well? So let's take a closer look. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, so I don't quote all, thir all 39 verses here, but I list the key ones, and so we're going to break it up and look at those. In verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then co there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a Samarian woman, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. So this is very interesting here. The woman comes to the well. Number one, she's a woman. Number two, she's a Sumerian. And a Jew, and who's a man, uh, breaks two barriers. He breaks an ethnicity barrier, and he breaks a gender barrier. God does not know race, nor does he differentiate between a man or a woman when it comes to our salvation. And here's what Jesus said. He says, if you knew who I am, if you knew what I had to offer, which is, he says, is the gift of God, you would have asked me for the living water and not let me and not sit there and waited until I asked for you to give me something to drink. Now, it's interesting here. The Bible, John, records the time. He says it was the sixth hour or the day. It was noonday. It was 12 noon. It was the hottest period of the day. And, and something interesting actually happens at the sixth hour. So if we think deeper and we examine across the gospel, what was Jesus doing at the sixth hour? We see something amazing. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34 and 39, we see this story. Luke 23 covers the crucifixion. And Jesus said in verse 34, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now notice this. What time was it? It was about the sixth hour. What's interesting here is that it is mentioned at the cross in the sixth hour, Jesus was saving the thief on the cross. And here in John chapter 4, at the sixth hour, Jesus was saving the woman at the well. Today, it's you could say the sixth hour represents the day of salvation that uh, Hebrews mentions. Today is the day of salvation. The sixth hour. Today is the sixth hour where Jesus is saying to you, I am offering you forgiveness and I am saying, remember me for I will be with you in paradise. And so in both instances, Jesus was thirsty. On the cross, he says, I thirst. In Samaria, at the sixth hour at the well, he looks at the woman and says, I'm thirsty, for his disciples had left him. Guess what? At the sixth hour on the cross, Jesus' disciples had forsaken him. It's very interesting. Salvation of souls is not easy work. And without the living water, the Holy Spirit, no soul can be saved. And so Jesus is offering the Holy Spirit both to the woman at the well and to the whole world when he died on the cross. And he says, woman, if you knew what I was offering, you would have asked me for the gift of God. But without water, no seed can, can grow and produce fruit. Mark chapter 4, verse 28 is the, says, first the blade, then the ear, then the full ear in the corn. That parable is talking about 
uh, the growing of the seed, the germination of the seed, which requires water. Paul also mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 6 to 11, he talks about some will plant the seed and God will bring others to water the seed. But in the end, he says it is the Lord that brings the increase. And so we have to be co-laborers together with God in the salvation of souls because the sixth hour tarries long. And unfortunately, after the sixth hour is midnight, uh, if you look at the, the, the next significant period of time. If you go back now to John chapter 4, and we're re-looking at the woman at the well in verse 14, look what happens. Now we're going to examine her encounter with Christ and whether or not she received the Holy Spirit. But whatsoever drinketh the water of the water, that shall I give him also to be, oh goodness, but whosoever drinketh of the water, that shall I give him, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And so a well, a lot of people can have a, a water well on their property, but until that water is drilled for, the water is not sprung up. You don't realize it's there. And as it is with our relationship with God, every man has been given a measure of faith, but whether he chooses to take that faith and hide it in the dirt so it becomes squandered or whether he chooses to to sink the mind shaft deep into the word of truth that his faith might be strengthened determines how that water affects his life. Uh, here, the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring us up into everlasting life. The woman said unto Jesus, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. And the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I who speak to you am he. I would like to imagine her reaction here. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see, a man who told me that all that I ever did, can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So, our question, did the woman at the well receive the Holy Spirit, the wellspring of life? This is what we, we should ask ourselves, and this is what we're going to see. Question number one, if she received the Holy Spirit, she would be what? Convicted of sin, of, of righteousness, and of judgment. Remember, sin was being convicted of the, of the things we are doing wrong that we need to stop. Righteousness is being convicted of the things we are not doing that we should be doing for God. And judgment is being convicted of the sense of urgency that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than when we once believed. Do we see these things in her life of sin? The woman at the well was convicted of the wrong thing she had done. It, we, and I skipped it, but in verses 14 to 16, Jesus addresses her, her failed marriages. The woman at the well was married five previous times, and she was in an adulterous relationship. And Christ rebuked her of the sins. She came in contact with the conviction of sin, of righteousness. She was convicted of what she needed to be doing that she wasn't. What was her response when she had this encounter? the woman at the well went and shared her testimony with the whole town of Galilee. And that's in verses 28 and 29 of judgment. She moved with quickness and eagerness without wasting any time. She was in so much of a hurry that she left her water jar. And those water jars, uh, bring your, there, did it do it? Sorry, my screen glitched. She left her water pot. She was in such a hurry. And these water pots were huge. They carried them over their heads and they, they were very expensive. And most families only had one or two. And so you didn't leave them laying around. And they were the only source of water for how many ever many miles you had to walk. And she took off running an exercise endeavor. And yet she was so full with the living water, she forgot the physical water at the well. So she was convicted of the urgency of time. 
because we find out at the end of John chapter 4, Jesus was only in Galilee for two days. And so God used this woman at the well, a Samaritan woman at the well, and filled her with the Holy Spirit. And she revitalized an entire town through the ministration of the Holy Spirit. So in summary, let's look at what happened here. What is the first things that happens? What is the first thing that happens when you, we receive the Holy Spirit? When we read in Acts of Apostles chapter 2, verse 37, verse 37 says, when they heard the men preaching of Peter in them, it says, the crowd said, we are convicted in our hearts and ask, what shall we do? The word convicted here in Acts chapter 30, uh, 37 is the word kataisimai. Kataisimai is the only time that Greek word is used in the entire New Testament. And this was the response of the, entire, of the, the, the hundreds of people in the upper room, the 3,000 that got baptized. They were convicted in their hearts. And the, the English word doesn't do it just. The true definition of convicted means to be vehemently agitated in one's heart. It literally means to have a spiritual heart attack, a spiritual myocardial infarction, as they say in medical vernacular. And so these people were so moved in their heart of hearts that they, the instant reaction to coming in contact with the Holy Spirit was, what must we do to be saved? And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. And verse 38, uh, Peter retorts to, to their question. He says, the what? You must repent. And the how? By being baptized. The baptism is the how. The repentance is the what you must do. And the baptism is the how you must do it. Baptism is an outward sign of your inward profession of your heart of your relationship with God. If we look in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or the king's wine. The, the baptism is an outward show of your inward purposing of heart to follow God, no matter what, that your faith may be set in him. The second thing we see regarding the Holy Spirit is what are the gospel signs that come with the conviction of the Holy Spirit? We address this. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it means you are to be reproved or to conv be convicted of sin. Sin is what we are doing that's wrong. We all need to be convicted of what we are doing that's wrong that we might stop without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How do we know what we're doing is sin? Unless we come in relationship with God. The second thing is we are to be convicted of righteousness. There are things that need to be done in this world to finish the gospel commission. And without God's people responding to that call, that work will never get done. And in the end, we're even told not enough people respond and God actually sends angels to help finish the work. But what a loss it is for all of the people who don't partake of that gospel work. What a spiritual, I can tell you personally, that is such a spiritual blessing in my life to be a part of the gospel work no matter where we go. And you're never wrong to do the right thing. And answering the call to be in service to God is never the wrong thing to do. And the last thing is to be convicted of judgment. There is a sense of urgency. If you do not respond to the Spirit's pleading, you're in trouble. Because that's Jesus' way to, con to get to you today, is by the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Today is the day of salvation, and that's quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 reminds us that every day we live, our salvation is being determined. And it is for us to, be re to repent and be baptized. The example we gave was the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She was convicted in all three ways, which means she had a full encounter with Jesus and received the Holy Spirit in verity. She confessed her sin, went and did right by telling others and sharing her testimony. You know, we're reminded in Revelation chapter um, 12, it says, and they overcame him by the power of their testimony. Our testimonies are tools and our spiritual tool belt to fight the kingdom of Satan. And she moved with urgency 
and brought others to Christ while he was there for two days. This is what our desire should be in receiving the Holy Spirit. Do we see another example of the conviction of the Holy Spirit taught elsewhere in Scripture? And the answer is yes. You all can find probably a lot of places. These are the two I found in John 4 and in Revelation chapter 14. The first angel's message actually addresses all three of these as they be receiving the Holy Spirit is the beginning of your walk with the Lord. Revelation 14 and verse 7, it says, fear God. The fear of the Lord uh, is, is the same as in Proverbs as confessing your sins, which is what we're supposed to do, being convicted of sin. Then it says, give glory to him. What does it say? You should be convicted of righteousness. And what, do you, what is your response to this conviction? Doing the things that God requires of you to glorify his character, to glorify him, which is to testify of the good things he has done for you to others as a witness. For the hour of his judgment is come. Here we see the judgment being convicted of the judgment reintroduced again. Time is short. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. This is so important. Jesus goes on when he um, looks at uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit here in John chapter 16. He says something very uh, sad, I believe. One of, the, you know, one of those moments where he's, he's stating the truth emphatically, but it's also loaded with a lot of emotion. And he says, why must the world be convicted of sin? He says, of sin because they believe not on me. Did you know that Jesus preached his ministry for three and a half years? And at the end of his ministry, at the end of 1,260 days of healing, preaching, and miracles, Jesus only had a small number of followers. There was probably, it probably went up like a, a bell curve. It got up, there was a climax, and when he was performing the miracles, and when it got to the sufferings of Christ and his crucifixion, the amount of people who were there for him forsook him. And he, at the end of it, he only had a small number of believers, even his original 12 disciples. One of the 12 forsook him. And at Pentecost, they had to anoint the 12th member because only 11 had remained. Why? Why does he say conviction of sin? Because they believe not on me. This is because they stopped believing in him. As we get closer to the second coming, more and more people are going to stop believing in God. They're going to stop believing in Jesus as their Savior. They're going to stop believing the promises of God's word. Peter and the other disciples accomplished more in one day on Pentecost than Jesus accomplished in his entire ministry. Jesus sowed many seeds. But he alone could not gather in the harvest. God has asked us to do a greater work than he has accomplished. And this is John 14 and verse 12. He says, greater works than these you shall do. Now Jesus raised from the dead. He walked on the water. He calmed the rushing torrent on the Sea of Galilee. He raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. He did all of these things and he rose from the dead. So what could he mean by greater things than these? you shall do. And there's only one thing greater than walking on water. There's only one thing greater than healing the blind physically, and that is bringing people into the kingdom of heaven. The only thing greater than a physical miracle is a spiritual miracle where through the working of the Holy Spirit in your life, somebody you're ministering to who is dead in their sins becomes dead to their sins. We must be soul winners for the kingdom of God that we may be partakers of the harvest. And as it says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 24, it says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, for the, la for the harvest is great and the laborers are few. But Jesus has promised in John chapter 14, you will do more soul winning in your day at the end of the world than I was able to do in three and a half years as the Son of God during the time of Jerusalem. He did not mean that we would perform bigger miracles, but that through the Holy Spirit, we would be tools to gather in an even larger harvest. The Spirit is going to do great work through all those who allow themselves to be convicted and to go through the baptism of water and fire, that they may be fit for the kingdoms of heaven 
and be prepared to win souls wherever they're found. Ellen White says in The Desire of Ages, she says, as the divine endowment, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, so it will be given today to all who seek aright. This power alone is able to make us wise unto salvation and to fit us for the courts above. Christ wants to give us a blessing that will make us holy. These things I have spoken unto you, he says, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 15, 11. Joy in the Holy Spirit is health-giving, life-giving joy. In giving us his spirit, God gives us himself, making himself a fountain of divine influences to give us health and life to the world. I hope and I pray that this is your desire today, that you would be willing to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe some of you have been Adventist your whole life, but never really understood what it means to have the Holy Spirit. We get, we get caught up in worshiping God in the truth, but we forget what it means to worship God in spirit. And this is what it means. Sorry, my screen is constantly spazzing out. Oh my goodness. All right. That's the, the close of our, our Sabbath sermon today. Um, but I want to bless, uh, I want to thank you all for, for sticking it through, even some of the technical difficulties. And I, I just pray for each one of you. I want to thank Pastor Carlos for, for giving me the opportunity to spend time with you all today. And um, I, I will keep each one of you in prayer. And Pastor Carlos, do you have anything in closing? Uh, no, no. If you want to just have the, the closing prayer, I just want to thank you again for, uh, uh, you know, for being with us, for taking the time to, to spend with us. And I don't know if you want to let them know about your, your website, your ministry. Yeah. Um, so when, when I, when I left uh, medical school, uh, there's a lot of energy in that. And so I redirected that energy and kind of created a little ministry called Protestant Church Ministries. And based off of the, the, the biblical council and the council of the great controversy, I created this ministry to reach Protestants, which is why it's named that way. Uh, but uh, it's, it's run by Adventists. I, I do a lot of work with Adventists. You're not going to find anything on the site that is against Adventism. In fact, it's Protestant in that it's sola scriptura, but it's teaching the pillars of Adventism. As we know, it. there are Bible studies about the Sabbath and the state of the dead on there. There are Bible studies about practical godliness and soul winning. And so you all can go through there and you can even refer your non-Adventist friends to the site. Um, the site isn't tied to any one church. It's just a ministry page. And you can just, uh, you can go on there and pull off the PDFs and the Bible studies and go through it. And you can be assured that everything they find is going to be sola scriptura or seated and rooted in, in the Bible. And so it's a resource. It's a tool for, for practical sharing of God's word. And, and so that's kind of where I'm taking the ministry and, and how I, we've kind of built it up. And, and so this website is protestantchurch.org. It's very simple. .org is for, for churches or ministries or nonprofits or of like manner. And so it's protestantchurch.org, no space, no caps. And you can use that as a resource um, if you want. Um, but uh, we've been able to travel. Just this last week, um, I was canvassing up in kind of uh, Morgantown slash Cumberland, Maryland area, and there were some people we met going door to door knocking, going over the Bible studies and Bible readings for the home and stuff, and and one of the, the couples there that answered the door, they were named David and Kimberly, and they were an older couple, and David had had a stroke, and he was smoking cigarettes, which there's a relationship between those, and, and like he was trying to get his life back on track. And they were asking questions about the Sabbath. And we, we went over, uh, there's, there's a lesson on the website called, um, that, that's up there called um, uh, Lessons from Within Noah's Ark, Lessons on Salvation. And I, we, I took him through Noah's Ark and we asked him how many animals went into the ark of every kind. And the wife said, oh, two by two, one male and one female. And I stopped her and I said, uh, would you believe me if I told you you were wrong? 
And she goes, no, no, no. I watched the Noah's Ark movie on TV. There were two animals of each kind. I was like, well, should we believe Hollywood or God's Bible? And she goes, well, we should believe the Bible. And so we took her to Genesis of this, the story. And what she had overlooked was that seven of every clean animal and seven of every clean bird went into the ark. And, and so I asked her, I said, how come God took the seven of the clean animals? And then her husband goes, I think it has something to do with the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. And, and they all, his wife goes, yeah, the Sabbath, I've heard about it, but our pastor won't talk about it. They, I think they went to Assemblies of God Church and, wow. and they were asking all these questions. And so we ended up getting into a Sabbath study. Uh, but I was able to refer them to that site and, and give them one of the Bible studies on the Sabbath. So it's a good resource. Um, you never know where you're going to be at. Um, and again, you know, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says, you should sanctify the Lord God in your heart that you may be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so we should be spending time in the word. And I'll, I'll touch on like the, my, the question, the motto that Pastor Carlo shared was, how much more would we know about God? How much closer in a relationship would we be with Jesus? And how much more could we hasten the coming of the Lord, like Peter says, if we studied our Bibles like a, a medical student studies to pass their boards, right? Um, if we spent, um, you know, if we spend one hour a day in the scripture, I'm mean, sure every pastor would rejoice if his whole church was spending an hour a day reading the Bible. But imagine if the church spent eight hours a day reading the Bible and not just reading it, but studying it comparing the scriptures, looking at everything. Um, you know, you have to get into the word of God. It, it, it's, it's in there. It's, things are hidden beneath the surface and, and there are so many blessings in it. And I'll tell you this, we're up, we're, we live in a world of spiritual warfare. And when you do not read your Bible, you do not study your Bible, you, it's like, here, here's, Here's like, here's your soul inside of your hands and like, here's prayer and here's the Bible and it guards your soul from demons. But the more you stop reading the Bible and the more you stop praying, the weaker your, your defense against, against the devil. And, and so when you quit reading and you quit studying, this hedge opens up and it gives the devil a foothold to come in and, and to weaken your faith, to discourage you, to keep you away from listening to the pleading of the Holy Spirit. And, and as this wedge gets larger, he can drive a wedge between you and God. And that wedge does two things. Number one, it discourages you. And number two, you know, you have a cognizant memory of, oh, maybe I should read the Bible. But the farther away you are, the greater the stronghold the devil has over you. And it's harder for you to return to the scriptures, which is why we're told in the Bible, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't hesitate to keep getting into your Bibles, especially if you're struggling whether, you know, to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's an and, not an or or a but. It's both. And I was witnessing to one of my Baptist friends about that verse in John 4, 34. It says, worship God in spirit and truth, for the Lord is truth, or for the Lord is that spirit. He says, well, are you saying everybody who doesn't keep the Sabbath is going to hell? He goes, what about my grandma? She worshiped God in spirit, but not in truth. And that's like a hard question to answer coming from a Baptist. Uh, but what's so interesting is I shared with him, I said, no, look at what the rest of it, what, what God teaches in entirety in his gospel. It says he has given every man a measure of his faith. And according to the truth, which we have, we will be judged accordingly. And judgment begins at the house of the Lord, 1 Peter 4, 17. I said, if you, this truth has come into your house, think of when Jesus was preaching and he comes, uh, and Zacchaeus sees him and he invites him to, uh, Jesus tells him to come down and he comes to his house. My favorite verse in the story of Zacchaeus is when Jesus entered the house of Zacchaeus, Jesus says, today salvation has entered your home. And so when Christ comes into your home, he doesn't just bring the truth. And nor does he just bring spirit. He brings the spirit and the truth into your house. And salvation at that point is placed in front of you. And how do you receive that salvation? Second, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. To be repented of your sins and to be baptized not only by water, but in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the spirit does what? He has come to lead you into all truth. So if you claim you want to worship in the spirit, but you don't want to hear the truth, then the spirit you have is the spirit of Satan. 
And in Great Controversy, page 305, we read that it is the spirit of Satan that is the antagonist to the spirit of Christ. And so I will leave you with that. And again, I want to thank you all. And I pray that uh, you know, each of you will walk in the Holy Spirit this week. Uh, thank you all. Amen. You want to have a closing prayer? Yeah, sure. Let's have a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, as we come before you on Bend and Knee this Sabbath morning, we are a church decentralized on this Sabbath day due to extreme circumstances on the earth. Lord, this only means that the signs of your coming are pointing us to the soon return of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we are here, we are faced with the decision to accept the Holy Spirit into our lives, that we may be sealed unto the day of redemption, lest we lose that blessing as you withdraw your Holy Spirit from the wicked who have rejected your love and your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you'll be with those here, that you'll be with Pastor Carlos and the four churches in his district, that you'll bless his church family and their members, and that you'll allow us to walk in Christ, and that we will be able to lift him up wherever we go. Lord, forgive us from our sins, where we have fallen short of your righteousness, that you will lead us into the way everlasting, and that you will give us the living water. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.